The world is more complex than ever before, moving and changing at an incredible rate. No one is immune, not even the most successful leaders of today's best-known companies. We are taking the global industry to new assumptions, beyond agile and business agility. Be ready to understand the science behind high uncertainty and accelerated change. Be ready to challenge your organization. Join us at the Enterprise Agility World Conference to know more. The largest event on science, organizational change, and enterprise agility. Enterprise Agility World Conference. The place where science meets organizational change. Hello, hello everyone, wherever you are in the world. We are live here. We are live here from the Enterprise Agility World Conference Studios in San Francisco. I hope you are doing well today. I will just take a few seconds to double check you are there, to double check that um, you are prepared for this. Today we have a very interesting topic. I know that many people watching this are trying to help the government in different countries and trying to come up with great ideas when you know, maybe sometimes governments are not the same as a startup or any other company. And then, uh, you know, the first thing we need to understand is which technique we want to use, how to uh, work with this. And, and sometimes we have to understand that all companies are different, you know, governments are different, and we have to make sure we understand where we are. We need to make sure that we understand how things are working and also make sure that we understand which techniques. I know that in the, probably in the last um, a few years, people tend to use just certain frameworks, but there is a world outside frameworks. There is a, a, a lot of customization, a lot of tools you can use, a lot of situations that you need to think out of the box and you need to make sure that you are prepared for that. So what we're talking about, um, you know, all these topics, uh, the, the first question is, is there anyone in the world who have done it? Is there anyone in the world who has been um, trying to uh, take a government or, or um, some part of the government in a different direction? What is the experience? How this person did it? And the different challenges. And this is what we're going to be talking today. We're going to be around for 30 minutes. If you have any question, you can place it on the chat box. I'm very, very happy to have you today. Wherever you're in the world, just say hello to us. Just make sure you are ready because we have a very interesting conversation. And then the interesting conversation we're going to have today also, uh, we're going to go through several topics. If you have any questions, if you have anything you want to know, just go for it. Go to the chat box. And I'm checking here. I have Marshall today. I'm happy the streaming is doing great all around the world. And uh, I want to welcome Marshall, a friend from the house here. He's going to be at the Enterprise Agility um, World Conference this year. And where, where you are you located? I'm based out of Phoenix, Arizona, USA. Uh, uh, what's the temperature there? Well, right now it looks like we're approaching uh, a little over 100 degrees uh, here shortly. So in the, in the afternoon, it'll be pretty warm. So. Wow, well, that's okay. And, and then they, if you like warm weather, I mean, imagine many times um, we feel like it's a warm weather, especially with companies, right? A hot weather when we need to deal with, this, <laughs> with certain issues. So I have a question that um, is totally outside of the box. It is that how did you manage with COVID now during the last two years with, mm -hmm. if you were helping the government or any other company? I'm curious mm -hmm. about this. Well, we uh, believe it or not, we've had government clients that were already um, having their IT and business functions working completely remote prior to the pandemic event. So it was rather easy for us to adapt our teaching mechanisms as well as our consulting and coaching mechanisms uh, to remote work. It has been challenging though. Uh, like many, um, we deal with um, 
the human factors and the digital wall, um, hiding behind the digital wall. And so we have to adapt our approaches to engaging with people uh, to draw them out uh, from behind that digital wall and uh, find ways to build and maintain those relationships so we can be effective as consultants and coaches. So let's start from some, some questions. I know there are people in Europe, there are people in Asia, even in America, that, and when I say America, I say whole America, also including you know, Latin America, that they are trying to help the government. Now, the government is um, sometimes it's challenging because you have a fixed budget. You, so, sometimes you have people who are not really motivated. Sometimes you do, uh, you can be surprised. And then this is start basically with the foundations of this. When you try to help the federal government or some other area from you know, the government, what's the difference you generally see a very high level with a private company or a startup or some other company you're trying to help with? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it's a common uh, discussion point between our commercial clients and our government clients. Um, there are differences. Uh, there are different constraints in the systems themselves that have been created um, by people who create governments, uh, government agencies, departments, etc. cetera. Uh, I would say, generally speaking, most of the patterns that we apply uh, in coaching techniques, consulting, the bodies of knowledge that we bring to bear, the tools are applicable to both uh, types of, of clients. Um, unique constraints in government can be of course, laws uh, that govern uh, the country that you're operating in, um, uh, policies and procedures that are dictated by those governments, uh, where you have um, compliance uh, that you have to uh, work with and, and those constraints in the system. Uh, but we apply the same basic techniques, a constraint in a for-profit organization and a constraint in a non-profit organization. We approach them essentially the same way. Um, we have to meet people where they are and lead change from that point of impact. Well, that is interesting. Let me say hello to Paola from Mexico. And also Stefan is in Germany. And then I imagine that, uh, you know, we have people trying to understand what, what we do, where to start, what has been your experience. Where do you want to start with this conversation? What, what do you think is the, the, the first thing that um, you want to recommend based on your experience in the federal government, on your work, uh, to someone in some country working with a similar government? Let's start with the basics. Well, um, I think it's critically important to understand the agency or department or government that you're working with. Um, bring things back to the social level, uh, back to the people, the human factors, and understand that while we uh, may have different opinions about how governments work and how big or small they should be and how complex they can be, it is people and relationships that we are managing with change. And we have to bring that humanistic approach and uh, empathize with people where they are. And so a lot of the engagements that we work in on the government side, um, we, we approach them where they are at. We talk about goals, just like we would with a for-profit organization. Um, their motives and their incentives may be different, but we have to adapt ourselves uh, as consultants and coaches to where they are and where they are in their journey. Uh, so I recommend uh, for folks that, are, that want to work within the government or are currently working in the government, uh, keep in mind those basic social skills, those basic consulting skills, empathy, apply in any type of environment. It's just people, it's networks, uh, it's organizational structures, it's interactions, collaboration. Uh, and at the end of the day, um, the incentive model might be different, but that ultimately the goals are what the goals are, whether it's defined by the mission, like with NASA, uh, they're obviously, uh, you know, we're getting ready to launch Artemis One, uh, the mission to the moon and beyond. And the mission is tied to the exploration of space, whereas a for-profit organization may have, um, you know, profit motives. For us as consultants, it's, it's meeting the customer where they are. Well, I think it's important what you are saying because sometimes we are preconditioned when we go and try to go work with the government, uh, we put our limits and we say, I cannot work in the government in the, you know, in the same way. I cannot use the same tools because, you know, it's sometimes it's difficult to define what is business value for them, what's your customer is, which people you are, you know, 
making happy with your product. And, and this is, I think, a good starting point, what you say is about um, going back to the, 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 the human point where um, you, you use the same tools. You don't condition yourself because you are working for uh, the government. Correct. And now, now the, the question is in, in the, I mentioned that you, you started working with the government and you have your experience. You have been there uh, for several years with NASA also. Uh, let's start from uh, some of the, the transformations or things that you did um, maybe in the last few years. If you don't have to mention to whom, but you know, which kind of project was it? Then let's try to debrief a couple of things that for you are important uh, to understand when you work with the government and also uh, what's your experience is, what you learn, what the tools you, 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 you have been using or you created eventually. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've been working with the United States federal government, uh, different parts of the federal civil side, as well as the Department of Defense side since 1999. Uh, started wow. My, um, so you I started my well. professional career uh, with the federal government. And uh, about a third of my career has been with uh, for-profit uh, enterprises. And I'm in it um, to make a difference. Um, so I am uh, often uh, say that I'm there to help government be better at government. And it's my, not my decision to decide what you know government is. I'm just helping the client mm -hmm. make it better. Whatever it is, I'm there to help them make it better at doing what they do. Um, government is a participatory process. We are all involved in it as citizens of our countries, and the government is a, is a making of our own. So um, our practice uh, as a consultancy is, is driven towards helping the government adopt lean and agile practices. So we bring to bear um, different um, bodies of knowledge for, I, I am an SPCT, so we have an obvious, um, you know, in our toolkit is the Scarlet Oil Framework. We also are TBM experts, uh, technology business management experts, uh, we have expertise in ITIL, the IT uh, infrastructure library, uh, as well as the flow framework. Uh, you know, Dr. Mick Kirsten, we bring to bear, and some proprietary thought leadership uh, tools that we bring uh, to all of our consulting engagements. Now, there are a couple of things that are different, obviously, is that, you know, identifying uh, business value, uh, sometimes you have to work with fit, fixed budget, sometimes you have to work with the, the department that not, are not fully involved or you don't see the, uh, um, you know, the final product or you don't even talk directly to those people. So let, let's try to see one of the challenges you, I, I want to try, I try to learn from you during this conversation too. So tell me one of the challenges you had, mm -hmm. how you solve it, what's your perspective, and, and we're going to go probably for 20 minutes talking about different challenges, different situations, sure. things you used. I'm very curious about that. Yeah, so one of the biggest challenges with every government client, whether it's federal government or state government, is the concept of, of managing value streams. And more, oh, yes. more, more distinctly, how do we fund value streams? Uh, at least in the United States federal government, I don't have experience with uh, governments in other countries. Okay, okay, Marshall, let me stop you there for a second because I want to remind the audience that in a company, in a private company, you might be able to choose for the value stream the people you want and maybe in the government it's different because obviously in a private company you need someone and you hire someone but then you might have some people but maybe those people, um, you know, they have different ideas around the world, they have different skills and then you have to engage them and that's a challenge with the value stream. In the government right? absolutely so if you look at the united states government as an example there are very much so great examples of a very product focused uh outcome that is desired by the united states federal government for example the f-35 fighter i'm not involved in that program but it's a product the whole purpose of that entire program and the investment by the united states congress is to produce an air superiority fighter for example many of our government clients they are doing other service functions for the government, for an agency like NASA. And we may work in the business side or the, or the IT side of a government agency like the VA, NASA, the FAA, et cetera. And the traditional value stream uh, lines around a manufacturer uh, as an automobile manufacturer or making widgets or uh, an F-35 fighter are very much so blurred. 
uh, in the service oriented uh, uh, parts of an agency. Um, And in fact, if you think about safe terminology, operational value streams versus development value streams, there is really no distinction for a lot of folks that are working in government agencies serving certain functions within an agency like their financial management system. Uh, So funding value streams, therefore, is one of the biggest challenges we see uh, to get to circle back to your question. Exactly, because you had a a set set amount of money uh, and then how you do it with this, right? Correct. And so when we engage with clients, um, client leaders, program managers, directors, uh, you know, folks that are, that are at the very highest levels of leadership in an agency, the, tr- the tradition and the culture largely defines how they manage their budgets and how they manage their money. That's very obvious to all of us. It's mostly around project mindset, at least in the United States. I suspect that it's that way in other countries as well. And in the United States, the Congress funds outcomes, which is very interesting okay. in terms of language. They don't fund projects. They fund outcomes. Oh, that's a very, very interesting. Right. So, for example, going back to the F-35 fighter, the Congress didn't say we want to fund an F-35 fighter project. They said we want vendors in the United States to innovate and build an air superiority fighter so that we can get better outcomes, obviously, uh, with, with utilizing that product for all other types of, of functions that get funded as far as outcome the government, it's the same basic principle. They want an outcome of an agency that operates according to the laws and regulations in the United States. So therefore they have to manage their budgets and money in a certain way. They have to manage their IT functions in a certain way and so forth and so on. So funding value streams is an interesting discussion because all of the funding flows through channels that we all package up in projects. But when we fund a value stream, it kind of breaks the thinking. So how do we transition that in government? And that becomes a very interesting conversation with every uh, government client and some commercial clients, quite frankly. Yeah. And also that uh, value stream many times requires to change the processes and mm-hmm. maybe to relocate people. And then I imagine in, in several cases, you cannot move people uh, inside or outside the value stream. You can um, not change the processes. So tell me a little bit more about what's your perspective, or at least the basics. Imagine we have someone, I don't know, somewhere in the world trying to do the same, starting with this. Mm-hmm. What, what's, what should we do with this? Imagine they want to create this value stream. So without getting into an extended discussion, we have to have an organizational change management plan, which I think is probably obvious if we're engaging in change yeah. at the systemic level. But beyond that discussion, we have to go and do discovery and we have to understand the client's context. Um, So before we go off and and preach about theories of how you could potentially operate with agile or lean thinking or systems thinking or whatever it is, we really have to dig into what the client's capabilities are and understand and learn where they are at first so we can then establish goals. Uh, We we may have a lot of uh, bias going in and, and towards the direction of where our solutioning might go or what we might see or the potential is, but you have to meet people where they are. Um, so uh, specifically with funding value streams, one obvious thing in a lot of our government clients, because they really are um, service functions within a larger department or an agency, they're doing operations and they're doing building some products. Mm-hmm. Right? So they're, they're providing services and products simultaneously and they're, fun- and they're funding projects. So if we want to talk about funding value streams, wouldn't a, uh, a product or a service that, is, that has been provided in a government agency have been created and then, then maintained, uh, enhanced through projects over a period of time? Yes. Another way to think about that is that we could collect a, a large collection of projects and think about, the, think about them over a period of time as actually funding a value stream. Right? It's simply at that point, helps the clients understand, uh, meet them where they're at. What projects do you have? What products do you offer? What services do you offer? And then help them to build that path or that bridge to what would funding a value stream look like? Uh, so that's the general approach uh, that we take with clients. It's a, 
it's a, a long-term effort. It's not a, uh, like a two hour workshop and then we're done. Uh, it's an iterative and incremental process that we go through and learning with the client and growing. So, so what I hear, maybe I'm wrong, is that um, you're talking about mapping the culture and maybe the restrictions in a way first before deciding. And this is something that we generally see many coaches that they just go and they go to apply certain techniques or frameworks. And then I think you are going in the opposite direction, which is, well, okay, I go there, I just, you know, take a look at this, see how people communicate, see how people move in the office, see the restriction, the limitation. And do you use any specific technique to map it? Uh, how do you do it? Do you do it with more people? Do you involve people? You create a team? How, how does it work? Uh, so we have an engagement roadmap that we use that is solution based. Um, and we have uh, certain client engagements where they're not interested in any framework because the client has done their own research and they, they want just generic coaching and generic lean and agile consulting, for example. For us as a consultancy, we always meet and do discovery first with no preconceived notions about what the solution is. Yes. Um, and some clients, they start out with, we just want to understand lean and agile because we haven't done it at all yet. And we engage and we just do the knowledge part of change management. Um, and other clients, they, they have a solution set that they already want. They already want uh, the skeletal framework or they already want some other uh, solution. Something more and specific, we, yes. And they're very specific. I think the key is for us that we remind ourselves as, as change agents is that we want to practice what we preach. So rather than going in and selling them something, let's go in and experiment and explore with the client so that we can ultimately build a solution that they build and we're not just giving them the answers and feeding them the, uh, uh, the solution. And something important, what you say is that uh, we have a lot of research in terms of language, but so you know how the brain reacts to the language that you use. And then I imagine that part of this is speaking the same language as your client and using the same words, the same terms. And then sometimes it, it takes a little bit of research. Yeah. Yeah, for, for organizations that have not um, formally uh, implemented Agile as a value system or a Scrum, uh, you know, as a framework for managing their processes or any of the other scaling uh, frameworks that are out there, we really, it's really, really important in my experience to meet them where they're at because we can go in with our level of experience and knowledge and to your point, use jargon that they just don't understand. And perhaps I catch myself doing that sometimes. I get a little bit too ahead uh, of, of the change curve. Um, we really have to have a finger on the pulse of what is the pace of change that a client can, can move at? Um, how quickly can they really go? Um, and we should pull them along uh, in some cases and other times we should let them um, iterate. And, and if they're just iterating and it's not a whole lot of movement, that's okay too. If we're learning and we're growing. Um, so yeah, that's an interesting facet to think about as well. Because iteration is not just about a product. It's also about changing your procedures, you know, doing everything, all the infrastructure in order for you to succeed. And then mm -hmm. I, I want to go later to the scaling part, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to Put the thread little by little trying to understand you know the, the second thing that, that you also mentioned is about founding so imagine that you understand the culture now you are working with the federal government you are working with nasa uh, then you discover the culture then you need to form first these values to so how you do it first and then this is connected mm -hmm. to people different mindsets that you might mm -hmm. have you cannot get rid of people in the government. Sometimes everyone has to be engaged. It's not like mm -hmm. a company you say, you know, I don't need you anymore. And, and the second thing is about founding. So where should we start? Sure. Uh, great question. So one thing that we can observe from the Agile Manifesto, uh, besides the purpose statement of it, helping others, um, but business people and development working together, it's, it's obviously the manifesto is written in a very software centric way but we can take those principles, we can apply them even to an organizational change management pattern. So one of the key things uh, for us is building an environment uh, with the client 
to avoid the common top-down uh, solutioning approach with, with little to zero collaboration. So um, you might call it connecting strategy to execution. Um, you might call it just collaborating at scale. Um, when we lead, go into any engagement, regardless of the size of the client, we'll, we'll expend a considerable amount of effort because we usually are brought in by director level, middle mm -hmm. management or above executives, depending on the client. Um, we obviously want to work at a level in which we can apply systemic thinking to the solution that for, for change and not just get stuck in local optimization. The specific tools that we do that are to engage with leaders, um, make sure they understand what leading change means, assessing whether we have the ability to lead change, uh, and then giving them the knowledge and training them on the skills uh, for that, depending on where they are. And then very quickly uh, testing the culture to understand whether their culture allows for true systemic collaboration. In other words, let's say for example, that we were brought in at the very highest level of an agency or, or department, uh, the general, like the four-star general brings us in, for example, or the agency administrator. We don't want to go into any engagement and have that leader make dictates about change because top-down dictates, as we know, they have limited shelf life and they have very limited sustainable impact long-term because they're not truly connecting to the people who do the work. But how can a single leader connect to 50,000 or 100,000 people in a large agency? We focus change on value streams, right? So uh, where we can identify value streams and where we can identify a place where change can start at a particular point of impact, we try to connect leaders with the people who actually do the work and have them create a shared uh, solution for how change would happen. Uh, that comes in different forms. Uh, engaging with unions, if there's a union involved, uh, in, which many of our government clients there are. Um, we engage with union leadership at the very earliest stages of any transformation, as an example. Oh, that's uh, very interesting, yeah. yeah. Um, inviting uh, people who actually do the work to developing strategy. I mean, there are specific tools that we do that and facilitation techniques, but in, in many traditional organizations that would be unheard of. It might even be taboo. Uh, you're gonna invite a developer to our strategy discussion? What? Uh, yes. Um, and there's a lot of thought leaders in the space that talk about these types of things. I didn't invent this. Uh, we just utilize the, uh, the practices. So. And th this is interesting because obviously uh, I think you are talking about uh, making things visible, but also reinforcing visibility before even doing anything and working with leadership. Now, the, the question here is, do you place any rules? So you have, you know, when you start um, increasing visibility, people, especially in the government and other companies can be the same, might not feel comfortable with this increasing visibility and then how you work with them, uh, how you deal with situations that people might not feel comfortable with, uh, uh, you know, delegating things, or trying to be involved into all the things that they did not get used to, they don't feel comfortable, et cetera. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm really not familiar with that. I've never met any resistance ever uh, for change. Uh, that was me being sarcastic, by the way. So I thought, <laughs> um, it's good you tell me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, so uh, the, I, I realized when I was saying it, the, the language may not have transmitted, but so we, we, always meet resistance. It doesn't matter whether it's government or commercial clients. Um, yeah. The, I think this is where the human factors um, really come into play, uh, the psychology of change. And we really have to spend a considerable amount of effort um, engaging with people and helping them to be not just um, defensive about whatever change we're proposing, but to be part of the change. So for example, a classic example is your, your organization may have a, a, a project management office, a PMO. And the agile coach goes in and says, well, we're gonna do agile and we don't do projects anymore uh, like that. We're not doing waterfall or phase gate or wherever, however you characterize it. Um, if you go in guns blazing, uh, you're, not gonna, you're not gonna get a lot of people to be on board with supporting your change. So um, 
that classic metaphor, you know, you can catch a lot more bears with honey, uh, right? So uh, in our client engagements, we try to go and, and build those relationships early. We try to oh, understand, that's, that's thing, yeah. right? Uh, as early as possible with a PMO, for example, whether it's an agency level PMO or a PMO in the value stream or portfolio or within the group, uh, it doesn't matter which part of the business units or organization. Meet them, talk about what their goals are and understand their incentives. If you understand the incentives and the intent of the PMO and their policies and procedures, then we can begin to build bridges to whatever our ideal is that we're, we're there to pitch, whether it's lean and agile practices, obviously uh, that's what I do and uh, what I'm passionate about. Um, but that is the, uh, the, the basic approach as an example. We would go to a PMO like at NASA. NASA has a PMO very early on within the OCIO. We engaged with the NASA PMO and we built the relationships and we started to talk about they're, they have a very public, by the way, anybody can go to nasa.gov and they can look up NASA's PMO and all of their policies and procedures. And we have been actively working with them for the past several years on building an, an alternative path for lean and agile ways of working and ways of thinking. That didn't come in one day or one week or one presentation. That is managing the relationship and managing the, and understanding the incentives of the individuals and bringing them along rather than trying to, to bludgeon them and say, I have more authority than you, therefore you have to change. That, that doesn't really work. So. And in my experience, people, when people evaluate incentives, maybe many people in leverage as money, but there, there is power, there is reputation, there is connection. Some people might feel that if you are moving that person to a different area of the organization, they are going to be disconnected what it matters for them. They're going to lose power or prestige. And this is where the amygdala activates, where, you know, you do not behave very rational. And then from outside, you can see that, but not the person there. Let me, one second, let me say hello to Hector in Brazil and Julissa, she's in Peru. Um, and then let me, so I think we, we are talking about mapping the culture, mapping also the, um, what the intention of people there, mapping also uh, what the rewards are. Sometimes, many times, the rewards go against the system in, in some government. How you deal with that? When, for example, if, if someone is going to evaluate me for my performance and then you, can, you cannot change this. Maybe in a private company, you go talk to HR or people and then you change it, but in the government, you cannot. How you deal with these situations in the government? Yep. So the first thing is to manage the psychology of the situation. We're all human, even us as consultants. Just because change is hard doesn't mean we shouldn't do it. And um, no, that's we have to remember, yeah, we have to remember. I love too, that phrase. Yeah. Um, so remember too that we have to th to think in positive terms. We have to think about what is the art of the possible. Um, you know, which is reference to a lot of the thought leadership that we subscribe to. So. Yes, we have those constraints. Yes, there are laws that prohibit us from doing that, that, we, that are not easy to change, but they're not impossible to change. Um, but what can we change? What is the art of the possible today? What systemic improvement or team improvement can we make today that could positively affect the outcomes of the business, the outcomes of the mission, or the outcomes of the team, or enhance the experience for the employees and staff uh, in that uh, agency? Um, so we, we bring to bear those, those um, uh, approaches to um, managing change uh, across the spectrum, uh, wherever we're at uh, working in the agency or, or department. Well, something interesting you say is um, you have been mentioning from the very beginning about systemic. systemic and systemic says that it, it doesn't matter if it's big or small, a small change can have a big impact. And sometimes as consultant, we are looking also, uh, or many times, to change something big to produce a big outcome and sometimes by changing something small you have a huge outcome a change over there i think this is uh, very very important um, and also to understand that um, there are certain restrictions that you're not going to be able um, to change that before we go for the founding and as we have 10 minutes um, so before we go for founding and also scaling 
which what I need to know, because now there are plenty of people listening to this that are working in other governments in other parts of the world. What should they know about this, you know, this process of value streams, of uh, initial mapping, et cetera? What do you want to add? Well, I would say with any government client, um, we have to have parallel transformation efforts going on. Um, you may be brought in to a certain group within an agency or a department within, your, within the government that you're working in, whether it's local, state, or federal, it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But you should always have a mind to systems thinking and avoiding what we call the local optimization trap. And we call it the local optimization trap. Keep in mind that it's still optimization. Yeah, of course, of course, yes. So that doesn't have any, that doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that it's zero value, it still has value. But we don't want to leave things on the table where we could potentially do systemic improvements to an entire agency or organization when we are positioned or have influence and ability to do that. Now, remember that we work through proxies sometimes. Sometimes we're just the consultant and we're just, and we have to work through a champion, a change champion in the agency. Right? We do that all the time, by the way. Uh, it's on our engagement roadmap. Um, we look for internal champions um, and we work with those internal champions to lead change across an agency. So um, I would encourage everyone to think about the parallel efforts of leading change, not just within the small group that you're in, but how can we utilize Cotter's method, for example, generating short-term wins? How can we use the wins at our local level to influence change at the next level above us? Or go for big, um, you know, go for, go, go for the big uh, thing. Uh, try to get an audience in front of the, uh, the director or the, the agency uh, uh, leader and, and make the pitch uh, as, it, as it will. Um, so we do that with all of our customers and we, we navigate change. You navigate obviously in government politics just like in private companies. And we strive to influence change as much as we can in a positive manner, using the bodies of knowledge and the solutions that we bring to bear. Well, sometimes I think it's important to understand that uh, when, whenever you want to influence something, if government or any other company, you, if, even if you want to influence a team, you need to build a network outside that team because that's how change works. So you, even if they told you that, you know, they wanted something with some team, most of the things that team, the team needs are outside that team, right? That's correct. This is, a, this is one of the important things. And the second important thing, it is that uh, all companies, even the government, they have their own speed. So if you push, push too much, then you can get uh, higher resistance or people against you. Also, uh, something that many coaches I have seen they do, they take responsibility for the change, and it's not your responsibility. Um, I, I think it's, it's their responsibility to change, but every area in the government, every company have their own speed. And then sometimes obviously managing the feeling that you could potentially go more or further and you do not, you need to understand that this is what it is. This is a, you achieve what it was possible, right? And I think this is also important to understand. Leaving yourself when you know that, you know, you could get 10 and you get two or three, it's all about your, you know, managing your emotions also. So uh, tell me a little bit more about, let, let's move into the founding. How we found this uh, value stream when you are working for the government? Unless you want to add something else here that I'm missing. There are so many things, obviously. Yeah. So um, oftentimes, um, I, I don't know why, uh, we've actually talked about with my team about this recently. Most often we're brought into the IT or software development, software product parts of an organization, um, whether that's a pure product play um, with a, a full stack product or just a software product, et cetera. It's most often that case. But interestingly, some of our clients were brought in and they're just pure product companies and were brought in through the product management function as consultants and change agents and agile coaches and not through the IT or software functions, which is uh, an interesting pattern. Um, ultimately, I think the, the success rates are irrelevant whether the, where the source comes from because of the, the, the tools that we use, right? The knowledge that we use. Um, so with regard to value streams, 
the the tools, the bodies of knowledge that we use, the frameworks that we use, some of them have very explicit patterns that we follow uh, to identify value streams. SAFE has the value stream identification workshop. Um, in the past couple of years, um, we've uh, had Dr. Mick Kirsten's work uh, come out in the flow framework uh, in his book, Project to Product. And we've applied that knowledge uh, and those practices as well and really moved towards a pattern of asking customers to think about value stream management and very much so working on transitioning people from thinking about caps capturing effort and changing systems and solutions through projects and instead thinking about how the value flows through the system that creates and sustains those products and, and avoiding the project trap. Uh, and everybody knows what projects are and the, the triple constraint and all that. And that takes a lot of, a lot of effort. So um, I think that having the discussions about identifying your value streams involves deep discussions about what the current operational model is uh, with clients, uh, whether they are a pure product uh, organization like we're building the F-35 uh, or they're an IT group within an agency where they're doing operational effort and providing services and the building products all simultaneously. So it's very much so blurring the lines uh, from a cherry picking an easy value stream of 35, that's pretty easy value stream to go and think about from a manufacturing perspective. Um, other agencies have a lot more complexity uh, in their system and we have to go in and map out would they believe their services and products? So you ask the question, well, what, what are your products and services? Most clients will tell us, uh, the folks who are working at NASA, they, they had a product and they showed us what the answer was, the VA, the FAA, they, they all can answer that question in some way. Our job is to help them identify the, and construct a map of the actual value stream with its networks that can help them achieve business or mission agility, right? Um, so that involves uh, deep discussions to unpack um, and map. So we use uh, Mural and we use Miro as, as online collaborative tools, for example. So we will visualize that, um, that product. We'll collect all the artifacts. We will put all the artifacts in one visual space in Mural or Miro or Lucid, for example. And then we work through discovery and applying design thinking. So we do we go through divergence patterns or convergence patterns to help the client understand and unpack what the true value streams are in that organization. Uh, interestingly, uh, value streams are not always uh, simple. Sometimes they're really big and they're really obvious like the Mississippi River in the United States or the Amazon. Very easy to see that river on a Google map. But some value streams are literally streams, no pun intended. They're very small and you, and you can't, they're imperceptible sometimes, but they are nonetheless uh, logical and real. And we have to balance um, how we define those and how we're gonna do value stream management to apply the people power that we have in an organization and all the other resources so that we can truly achieve a uh, business or mission agility. So I know that was a lot and a mouthful, but. That, that's that's what we're doing when we're thinking about value stream management in these organizations. It's a journey. It's not a uh, preconceived notion or a preconceived solution. Yes, and we, we're going to obviously have more time during the conference. But then can you summarize, at least in, when you were working with NASA or the federal government in general, when you're trying to found those value streams, mm -hmm. can you give us um, two or three obstacles that we generally come across that you solved? for example, already, that you know how yeah. to solve it. Um, we, uh, cultures, remember organizations have cultures when we arrive. And the kind of like the whole point of calling yourself a change agent is that we're going to change something. And our goal, of course, is to change the culture because we don't want to come in and say, thou shalt be agile, cool, you're agile, and then go away. <laughs> yeah. We relabel it. As soon as we leave, everything goes back to the way it was before. Everybody has a story about those consultants. And we don't need to name them, but we're, we're not in that. We're, we're in for uh, sustainable change, right? We're in to change the culture. Everybody's familiar with the Drucker quote, culture eats strategy for breakfast. We're in it for the long term. We don't go into any client saying we can solve all your problems in six months. 
every client I go into a lot, it's often asked, well, how long does change take? I don't know, three, five, seven, 10 years. I don't know. Let's find out. Let's go on a journey together. Um, so culture is oftentimes a limiting factor when you're first identifying value streams because the client leadership and management and people have preconceived notions about how things work and people are comfortable with where they are. And you're a consultant or you're an agile coach and you're going in and you're saying, what, what is the why? Why are we changing? Are you doing a good job communicating that? Is the why reasonable and rational? Is it a sufficient vision for change that's going to influence people to actually want and desire to change? If people don't have desire to change, what do you have? You have a scenario where you're just fighting against them. So we do spend a considerable amount of effort not leading for the client, helping the client leadership to lead. Lead, lead the initiative. We're the this is something that we said. Yes. Yeah. We, we say it on our team all the time. Um, a couple of individuals I'm thinking of, especially. We're not there to play the game. We're there to coach the game. We're not the players, right? Very important. Well, but sometimes your, your, your emotions put, drag you to take ownership. Correct. And then this is where the things do not work well, right? And this is so when you learn yeah, when you you know, and years are coaching. Yeah, I mean, we have different stances, right? Co consulting is consulting, then there's coaching in the different coaching stances, but it's very easy to slip into playing the game, and we really want to avoid that. But the reason why is that because then you are part of the culture and you're not actually providing knowledge and consulting and coaching on the new behaviors that we want in the system. So for example, some clients, when you engage on value stream identification in the beginning and you want to talk about, well, where do you want to go? What is your preference? What does leadership say? That you, you have to choose. Where do you want to start? We have to start somewhere. What monuments do you want to tear down? Going back to lean thinking, uh, you know, what, what a sensei would do, let's go tear down the monuments. Where do we start? they may have preconceived notions about where they want to start. We may see something that the client doesn't see, and it's our duty to help them to see that if we can. But if we cannot, we shouldn't force them to go to a place where they're not ready to go. Sometimes yeah, you have to is. let organizations fail so that they can learn. And that is the hardest thing to do as a consultant is to know that they're coming up with a wrong hypothesis that will not be validated and let them do it anyway. And sometimes you have to do that. I have client examples where they've done that, we've been in that scenario, and they've learned from it. And it's been fascinating and a really good experience over the long term uh, to have to, for them to actually be willing to fail and learn. Right? Well, I wanted to talk more about uh, scaling, but we run out of time as we have so many talks. That was kind of informal conversation, trying to to learn a little bit based on your experience. I know during the conference, you're going to have more time. You're going to have one hour all for you. And I think that uh, one of the things that uh, you said, very, very important is um, you need to understand that you are working with human beings. You need to understand the system. Maybe you should not uh, judge the system, but work with what you got. And uh, also you need to understand that you have a challenge with the value streams, uh, you should go with an open mind uh, just in order to do that. Uh, you also need to understand how things work, how hierarchies work. You need to understand founding is different in those places. And then I hope I can learn more. It, it has been a pleasure to have it today. I have so many more topics I wanted to know. I'm always very curious. Um, and we're going to learn that in the conference. Has been much of a pleasure. If you have... You know, about 30 seconds, you can add now something I'm missing here, something you wanted to remind. Also, I wanted to say hello to Jennifer. She's in Canada. So go for that. Yeah. Well, I first, I want to thank you, Eric, for the invitation and for the opportunity to learn with everyone and you. Uh, it's been a very good pleasure and uh, appreciate supporting the uh, EAW. Uh, again, thank you for the opportunity. I deeply appreciate it. Um, I love learning. I hope that everybody uh, sees themselves as a servant leader, uh, as an agile coach and a consultant as well. And uh, keep growing, uh, keep learning. Uh, that's what I'm here for. That's why I, I uh, have invested myself in this industry and uh, look forward to the, uh, the conference uh, in November and 
working with you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. And I'm happy also your conference is going to be translated into 34 languages. So many people working with governments around the world is going to be more than happy to learn from you. We are always willing. I've been also helping the government and other places. And I can see, you know, sometimes you lose a little bit of hope because you, you don't know how to use the tools. You don't know how to connect the dots there. And I think you, you have a clear vision. You have been learning for a long time how to do it. There is always, this is a path, you never ending path. I appreciate you having here. So um, guys, um, I will see you next week. I hope you have a good weekend, wherever you are in the world. You can also have the recording. You're gonna have the recording now, as soon as we finish this. And I will stay after we finish uh, two minutes with Marshall, please do not leave. We have a quick uh, chit chat. And, and then uh, guys, I will see you next week. Thank you, Marshall, for joining us today. The world is more complex than ever before, moving and changing at an incredible rate. No one is immune, not even the most successful leaders of today's best-known companies. We are taking the global industry to new assumptions, beyond agile and business agility. Be ready to understand the science behind high uncertainty and accelerated change. Be ready to challenge your organization. Join us at the Enterprise Agility World Conference to know more. The largest event on science, organizational change, and enterprise agility. Enterprise Agility World Conference. The place where science meets organizational change.